I'd like to now give us a little background on linear algebra. So often PCA and other dimensionality reductions are taught without using the linear algebra foundation, but I think you have a much deeper understanding of what's going on if you, um, if you can understand these concepts from linear algebra. So ideally you've had a course where some of these things got covered. You know, often it's, uh, it's, it's in the first two years of, of math for any um, engineering or, or uh, other, other sort of, you know, statistics or math student. Um, otherwise, I think you can, you can follow a lot of these ideas if you've had good high school math. So in linear algebra, we study things called a vector space. So a vector space consists of all the linear combinations of some set of vectors. So these u1 through uk are a bunch of column vectors, and we're going to take linear combinations of them. So what's a linear combination? Well, linear combination is just where you multiply each one of the vectors by some constant. So I'm going to call these constants c1 through ck, and then you add them up. Now, if you were to think about the set of all possible vectors could be, that could be generated in this way, you would get what's called the span of these vectors. So this, this, this is going to define some space, and uh, the, these, these vectors span that space. That's the language that we use. Now, in PCA and dimensionality reduction, we're going to be considering very special sets of vectors, and these, these special vectors are going to be called basis vectors. Now, basis vectors have two important properties. So the first is they're linearly independent of each other. What that means is uh, any given column vector cannot be written as a linear combination of other ones. So there's like something unique. Uh, th this is describing something unique. Um, each one of these vectors is, is unique in, in that sense. So that's kind of a, a loose uh, way to, to think about linear interpretation, linearly independence, but, um, but that's what it is. The second thing is they have to span the subspace. Okay, so, so the basis for some space, uh, you know, these vectors have to span that space. So I want to now discuss two example bases. So we're going to start with the most, um, you know, famous probably basis, uh, which is one that you've been using all of your your life, and you probably just didn't know it, um, it's called the standard basis. So the standard basis is going to have um, what's called the identity matrix and column vectors E1 through EK. So these E's uh, are meant to be these U's, but because the standard basis is so important, we don't call them U's. They get their own name, and that name is often uh, these E vectors. So let's go look at an example to really understand what, what's going on here. So let's, uh, let's take P equal to two dimensions. Now, I2 is the identity matrix for uh, uh, you know, having two dimensions. So this is the identity matrix. It's called the identity matrix because it's, it's like a one. You can multiply any two-dimensional matrix by this and, and it's, it's left unchanged. All right, so we can think of this as this is my E1 vector. This is my E2 vector. So we could, we could write this like this if we want. This is my E1 vector. This is my E2 vector. Now, my claim is that this is a basis. And so what that means, a basis for uh, the, the Cartesian plane, the x1, x2 plane. So if that's the case, I can write any vector in, um, in, in the Cartesian plane as a linear combination of these. So let's go do that. So I'm going to go make myself an x1, x2 plane. And I'm going to I'm going to make this 3. We're going to make this 6. So this is going to be the value 7. And if I try to keep roughly the same scale down here so that 
that things uh, basically work. Um, th this would be my, my Cartesian plane. Now, let's take a, um, a particular point. So here is a point. And, um, you, you know, this point you could think of as a vector. Uh, this is going to be the point 1, 7. And so we could go draw ourselves a, a line, if we like, um, showing that this is indeed a vector. Now, how do we write this point as a linear combination of these basis vectors? So here's one of my basis vectors. This is the E1 vector. This is the other basis vector. This is the E2 vector, if we wanted to graph these two. Well, the answer is this. I am going to take one copy of E1, and I'm going to take seven copies of E2. So you could think of this as 1 times 1, 0, plus 7 times 0, 1, and lo and behold, we get 1, 7. Another way to think about this is I'm taking one hop in the direction of E1, and then I'm going to take seven hops, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven hops, and that gets me up to this point. So uh, I, I hope that, you know, th th this, is, th this is very simple, I know, but it's illustrating something much more profound. You know, that any point in this Cartesian plane can be represented as linear combinations of these two vectors. Well, this, um, the standard basis is not the only basis in town. So there are other bases that we could use. So I'm going to call um, uh, this, this big U, uh, I've, I've written it in the course packet as 1, 2, minus 2, 1. So what I have here is a vector 1, 2. So 1, 2 is this vector. So this is 1, 2, otherwise known as a little u1. So this is little u1. And let's take another vector. So if I go minus 2, so minus 2, 1, unfortunately I'm going to overwrite this. This is going to be minus 2, 1, and we're going to call that u2. So my claim is that this is also a basis for the Cartesian plane. So I should, if, if that's the case, I should be able to write this point, 1, 7, as a linear combination of these two vectors. So l let's do it with simple algebra, simple arithmetic first. So let's take, I'm going to give you the answer. This is what you do when you solve systems of equations. This is going to be three, I need three copies of this vector, and I need one copy of this vector. And let's just go do the math and see if this works out. So if I take three times one, I get three. Three times two, I get six. And then I'm going to subtract off um, minus two and one. So this is going to be 3 minus 2 is 1, 6 plus 1 is 7. And so notice, if I take three copies of this vector, three cop and one copy of this vector, I get to that point. Let's just see how that works geometrically. So that's one copy. Let's go take another copy of it. So you could think of this as 2 times u1. And I'm going to go take my third copy of it. So here is my third copy of, um, of that. So 2u1 would be the point 2, 4. This would be the point 3u1, which would be 3, comma 6. So that's what I have down here. Let me just put a little arrow up there. Now I need one copy of this other vector. So notice if I go this far back, I am I'm at uh, 1 comma 7. So um, that's the that's sort of the geometric way to think of what these coordinates or constants are doing. It's saying take three hops in the direction of u1 
and go take one hop in the direction of U2. So go back that amount and you've arrived at your destination. And so that's what we have here. So um, the, the math is nothing complicated here, but it's really um, represent, representing something very important. So we'd call these, these constants, uh, 3, 1, the coordinates with respect to this U basis. So WRT means with respect to. So, so let me just uh, go back to this and, and kind of point out the, the parallel. So if I'm using the standard basis, the coordinates of this point are 1, 7, because I take one copy of that vector and seven copies of the other one, which gives us the coordinates 1, 7. If I want to describe this point in terms of this other basis, my U basis, the coordinates are 3, 1. All right, good. A few more basis terms for us. So... There are two more types of bases, or two more basis terms, orthogonal bases and orthonormal bases. So orthogonal bases are ones where the vectors that, that describe the, um, the space are perpendicular. So uh, what I have in my example here is a set of orthogonal vectors. And the way we know that is um, two vectors are orthogonal if their product, so let's just write this as u transpose 1 times u 2 equals 0. Okay, so if they're, if that, that's called the, the dot product. If the dot product is equal to 0, they're orthogonal. So let's just go check this out for my u1 and u2. So this would be u1 transpose. So think of this as u1 transpose. So I just turn it on its side. And here is minus 2, 1. So think of this as u2 as a vector. And so what is this? Well, this is just going to be 1 times minus 2. So I was when I do my matrix multiplications, I take this, pro this number times this number, plus, well, 2 times 1, and clearly this is 0. So this is saying that my two vectors are orthogonal in this particular basis. What's an orthonormal basis? Well, an orthonormal basis is where uh, all of the vectors have length 1. So notice this other basis that I have up here is not orthonormal. So let me just write u is not orthonormal. Not orthonormal. And the reason for this is, let's find the length of this vector. So if you, if, um, you want to see a, a geometric interpretation of this, this is 1, 2. The question is, what is that length? Well, if I, I have to use the Pythagorean theorem, so it's going to be 1 squared plus 2 squared. So 1 squared plus 2 squared, take the square root of that, is the length. And by the way, this is the square root of 5. So the square root of 5, and that's um, not equal to 1. Not 1, so it's not orthonormal. But it's very easy to make it orthonormal, all I have to do is divide by the square root of 5. Notice the other vector also has length, the square root of 5. And so now I have an orthonormal basis if I just divide everything by the square root of 5. All right. Are all bases orthogonal? Um, the answer is no. So let's go take a look at another uh, basis. Uh, call this U3. And uh, notice these vectors are not orthogonal not orthonormal. So let me um, write this out. So we have 1, 2, and 1 minus 3. Actually, we, we could probably just do it uh, here in the course packet. If I, if I, let, let's see if they're orth, orthogonal 
So to check their orthogonality, I would take this first vector transposed, so 1, 2, um, and, and then I would take the second vector. And notice the, the product here is minus 5, so it's not 0. But then you're probably wondering, are these still um, a basis? So if they're a basis, I should be able to write my, uh, my example point, 1, 7, as a linear combination of them. And the answer is yes. So it turns out if you take two copies of this first vector and I subtract one copy of the other vector, um, I get 1, 7. So let's just do that math here. What's 2 times 1 is 2, minus 1 is 1. So it looks like the first coordinate of, of this point works. If I take 2 times 2, I get 4. Minus a minus 3 is plus 3. So 4 plus 3 is 7. And so notice I, I can represent them this way. The reason I mention this is we're going to be using non-orthogonal bases when we get to factor analysis. And this is going to be, um, so it's kind of important to understand this idea that um, I, I don't have orthogonal vectors here. If I were to go over and graph this, let's just go graph it for a second here. This would be 1, 2. So this is 1, 2. And if I go 1 minus 3, so this is going to be 1 minus 3. Notice this is not equal to 90 degrees. So geometrically, that's the uh, interpretation of not having an orthogonal basis. All right. Um, I'd like to give you another example that starts to show how this is, um, this is really a very powerful um, idea that, that, that we've just been discussing. So let's take a bunch of points. So in, in, in this table, I've given us some points. So 0, 0. Then let's take the point 1, 2. So this is 1, 2. So we'll write this in, in, in vector form like this. And then let's go take another point that just happens to be 2, 4. And then I'm going to go take another point, which is uh, 3, 6. And you get the idea. I could, I could carry on as much as I want. In fact, I could even carry on in the other direction if I wanted to. So here's another point. This is an interesting one. This is um, minus 1, uh, minus 2. All right. Now, what you should note about all these points is they fall on a line. So I'm going to go make myself a nice line here. All right, so all these points fall in a line. Now, if I use the standard basis, so the standard basis is where I have um, two coordinates. I'm using you know, E1 and E2. Notice, um, so let me just write this down. With standard basis, I need two coordinates Uh, for each point. So if I had a million points on this line, I would need two million coordinates to describe the locations of my million points. Well, maybe I shouldn't be using the standard basis. So instead, what would happen if I used the basis, say, 1, 2, and then Minus, uh, minus 1, 2, like I had before. But um, notice, I can write each one of these points as a linear combination of just the first basis vector. I don't even need the second basis vector. You know, this would be the second basis vector that is orthogonal to it if I used an orthogonal um, basis. But uh, this is not even necessary because I only need to know how many copies of that first basis vector I have in order to uniquely describe each one of these points. And so that's what I've done down here. I've written out the C's. So for example, if um, this is zero copies of the one, two vector, this would be one copy, this would be two copies, this is three copies, uh, and so forth. And so 
the, the key point here is I'm, um, you know, I only need one coordinate. I don't need two. So if I had a million points here, I would only need a million uh, values to represent these two coordinate points instead of requiring two million coordinates. Um, likewise, I could use um, a, a, a normalized version of this where I divide by the length of the vector. It's just that my coordinates change. So I, I've described the same subspace but with different coordinates because my basis vector is different. Now, this starts to hint at some ideas that are going to be really important to us. So one idea is, how did I choose this basis vector, 1, 2? Why did I choose this? And I, and I think it, it should almost be obvious when we look at this example. It's because that 1, 2 or, or any... Um, scaled version of that, you, you know, describe that subspace. But there's, um, uh, you know, it kind of hints at a more profound reason, and that is this is going to minimize the errors. So um, by that, I mean, I don't need the second principal component. My second principal component for um, each one of these points is going to be zero because each one of these points falls exactly on the line. I only need to know how far I am along the line and, and, uh, and that's all I need. I don't need a second coordinate. All right, so that's going to be one, um, one way to think about this is we're minimizing the errors. Another, um, another way that, we're, that this uh, may, may not be as intuitive as, as what I just said is that this particular um, uh, basis vector is going to maximize the variance of my coordinates in that direction. Okay, so if, if I said I'm going to have a unit length vector, this, um, this particular vector is going to give me the biggest variance in the coordinates with respect to that vector. Let's just say I chose another one. You know, let's say, say I chose E2 as my, my, uh, my vector, the variance of my, of my coordinates projecting each one of these onto this uh, E2 axis would not be as great as the variance in this direction. So if you don't completely understand that, we're going to come back to this in a little bit with principal components analysis, and um, I think it'll become clearer. All right, so... Uh, I think I've I've covered everything on this page. the uh, The only thing is, um, you know, I, I've already mentioned this, but the scores are not unique. I could use this basis vector and describe those points perfectly, or I could use this different basis vector. I could even use a basis vector that points in the other direction. You know, if I used this as a, as my basis vector, I could still express the location of all these points, um, uh, you know, along the line. All right. So let's um, start to get closer to uh, PCA. So the, the example I just gave you was extremely simple in that all the points fell exactly on the line. And that's um, not very realistic. What's um, much more realistic is a situation where the points fall approximately on the line. And... Um, there's a, a full video that, that describes this example in depth that you can watch. But um, this um, just illustrates what's, um, what, what, what we're trying to do. So I, I, I hinted at this at the beginning of the video. We're going to choose this subspace that minimizes the sum of these squared orthogonal deviations in the same way that this subspace minimizes the sum of squared orthogonal deviations, which in this case would be zero. All right, I'm going to do one more thing in this video, and that is um, talk to you about a formula that often gets covered in perhaps a, a you know, high school analytic geometry class, almost certainly a um, Calc 1 class, you would have run into this, and then if you actually took linear algebra, you'd see this. It's called a projection. So, so what exactly is a projection? Well, it's a very simple idea. And I, I hinted at this at the beginning of the video. I want to 
um, the, the projection of this point onto this line is going to be the point on the line that is closest to it. So um, I think there's some benefit to actually deriving this form. All right, I'd like to now show us where this formula comes from. So let's go draw ourselves, uh, you know, a Cartesian plane here with x1 and x2. And let's say that I've got some vector out here. By the way, this works in, in higher dimensions. They don't have to be in two dimensions. Everything that I'm going to do next uh, works if you had p dimensions. So let's just say that this is my u vector. And I've got some vector out here, which is my x vector. And so um, I want to find the projection of x onto u. So that's going to be the point on u that is closest to x. And so the way I'm going to represent this is I'm just going to say that this is perpendicular because that's the way to make, um, that's the way to find the point here that is closest to x. Now, this projection of x onto u has to be on u. Okay, so because it, it lies on this u vector, this is going to be some fraction or multiple of u. So we can think of this as some constant or coefficient times the u vector. And let me just go put a little arrow over here indicating that, um, that that is the projection of x onto u. So this is going to be, you know, this is the entire length of u. So c in this case, I'm going to guess is about two-thirds. So I need to go about two-thirds of a copy of u to get to that point that's closest to x. So then the question is, what is c? Well, the way to find c is to note that um, these two vectors have to be perpendicular. So this vector right here is, is the difference between x and, and c times u. So x minus cu is, is this difference. And so what I want is x minus cu to be perpendicular to u. And so that, that's what that, um, that symbol represents. So how do, I, how do I guarantee that? And the answer is, we're going to make, make it so that the dot product is 0. So 0 has to be, well, take u, and I'm going to transpose that, times x transpose minus c u. Oopsie, we don't need an x transpose there. Sorry about that. And so um, I, I'm going to go do this math. This is equal to u transpose times x as a vector. Now let's go multiply this. The scalar c can come out in front. So this is going to be c times u transpose u. And this all has to equal 0. So I can go solve this. I'm going to move this to the other side. Let's move all that over to the other side and divide by u transpose u. So I end up with c is just u transpose times x. So that's that first term divided by u transpose times u. So that's what we found. Um, so that's where this, this thing is coming from. So uh, I think I, I, I wrote it um, transposed over there, but this is a scalar, so it doesn't matter. So you're just going to take the, the dot product of x and u, divide by the dot product of u and u, and multiply it by u. Okay, so let's, let's go try to understand this geometrically. So this is that constant. Let me just go write that up here. So this is saying, um, what fraction of a u do I go out in order to find this point? 
then this is giving me the direction. So this is, think of this as the length along U. This is the direction U. Now, there's a couple really important things to notice about this. So think of this as the length of the projection of X onto U. If we had picked U to be uh, of unit length, so we, we have an orthonormal basis, then what happens? Well, U transpose U is just one. The denominator then is, is you know, goes away because it's, it's one. And X transpose times U is going to be the length of the projection. So this is really, um, really kind of interesting. So let's just go write this out. If U transpose times U equals one, then the length of the projection of x onto u is going to be this. It's going to be whatever's in my numerator. So u transpose times x. Now, let's go write this out. This is really u1, u2. I have like two um, scalars here times x1, x2, and this is going to be a u1 times x1 plus a u2 times x2. This ought to look kind of familiar. It's, um, it's almost like a regression. In, in, in regression, we had betas. We had beta1 times x1 and beta2 times x2, and we interpreted those betas to say how important is x1 in determining y versus x2 in determining y. That's what those betas were telling us. Well, very soon we're going to be interpreting these u's in the same way. So bigger u's mean that uh, x1 has more influence on what we're going to be calling the component, the first principal component, which is this length, gth, I spelled that wrong. Um, this is a, x1 would have more influence on the length of the projection, which we're going to be calling our first principal component very soon, than x2. Uh, or maybe we would conclude the opposite if, if u2 was, was much larger. So this is a, extremely important to, uh, to, to understand that these u vectors just get multiplied by x, and we're going to be interpreting their magnitude kind of like what we did with regression.